Hello everybody, Dr. Yu here with the next video from the Calgary Guide video series, Cirrhosis, Pathogenesis, and Complications. As always, before we begin, please help us reach more viewers by liking the video just as it's starting out and by subscribing to my channel. With that, let's get started. Cirrhosis is a condition specific to the liver. That's why we don't say liver cirrhosis, we just say cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is an end-stage scarring of the liver caused by many different pathologies. These pathologies include infections that specifically target the liver, such as hepatitis B and C, autoimmune causes, such as autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cholangitis, or PBC, or primary sclerosing cholangitis, or PSC. Toxins, such as ethanol or alcohol, can affect the liver. Metabolic disorders, such as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, can also affect the liver. And finally, genetic conditions like hereditary hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin disease all can affect the liver. This collection of precipitating factors cause the death of hepatocytes, or liver cells, resulting in the inflammatory destruction of normal hepatic architecture. And after the inflammatory process is over, there's scarring and fibrosis of liver tissue. Although the liver is highly regenerative, within the context of the scarring and fibrosis that's already happened to the liver, the liver must find pockets of normal cells that regenerate within the scarred and fibrotic network. And as a result, liver regeneration results in nodules of poorly functioning cells within the fibrotic liver tissue. This collection of poorly functioning cells will disrupt the hepatic vasculature and will also disrupt the production of bile and the excretion of bile and also interfere with other liver functions. This is when the liver becomes cirrhotic. There's two main physiological complications of cirrhosis. First is that blood flow faces increased resistance when passing through a fibrotic liver as opposed to a normal liver. The second, of course, is reduced liver function, also known as liver insufficiency. Before talking about these two main pathophysiological pathways, let's first talk about the one thing that we shouldn't miss in a patient with cirrhosis, which is hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer that originates within the liver. Note that 85% of hepatocellular carcinomas occur in the background of cirrhosis, which makes sense because the chronic state of inflammation will tend towards making cells abnormal, especially in their cell division, resulting in cancer. So definitely do not want to miss hepatocellular carcinoma in the context of a patient with cirrhosis. Now let's talk about the first main physiological consequence of cirrhosis, which is increased resistance to blood flow through the fibrotic liver. The technical term for that is portal hypertension, increased blood pressure in the hepatic circulation. Because there's more pressure in the hepatic circulation, blood will back up into the collateral venous system prior to the hepatic circulation. And the collateral venous system basically is made up of the veins in the esophagus, known as esophageal varices, the veins in the rectum, the rectal varices, and the spleen. Blood backing up into the esophageal veins result in esophageal varices, which could in turn, if torn, lead to hemorrhage, causing a massive upper GI bleed that is life-threatening. Blood backing up into the rectal veins will cause enlargement of these rectal veins, leading to rectal varices, and hemorrhage there could cause a lower GI bleed. Finally, blood backing up into the spleen can result in the spleen becoming congested and enlarged, which would lead to increased trapping of blood cells and other cells within the spleen, causing pancytopenia, a reduction of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets in the body. The other consequence of portal hypertension is increased hydrostatic pressure in the abdominal capillaries. That would result in fluid being extruded from the plasma of these capillaries into the interstitial tissue. The interstitial tissue in this case would include the external tissues around the liver, such as the skin around the liver, resulting in edema. They would also include the peritoneal cavity, and fluid exudation into there results in ascites. Now this increased hydrostatic pressure in the abdominal capillaries is self-reinforcing. This increased pressure causes the body to adapt by releasing greater amounts of vasodilators, such as nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide. These vasodilators effectively reduce blood volume felt by the kidneys, and the kidneys then retain more water and sodium to further increase blood volume, which of course compounds the negative effect of increased hydrostatic pressure in the abdominal capillaries. Now let's talk about the second main pathophysiological consequence of cirrhosis, which is reduced liver function, otherwise known as liver insufficiency. First, the liver is where albumin, one of the major serum proteins, is produced. Low albumin synthesis means reduced oncotic pressure in the systemic capillaries, resulting in water exuding from the plasma of these capillaries into the interstitial tissues. This is another reason for edema of generalized body tissue, 
as well as fluid exudation into the peritoneal cavity, otherwise known as ascites. Liver insufficiency also means that the liver is unable to synthesize clotting factors, or anticoagulant proteins. This results in low measured clotting factors 10, 5, 2, and other clotting factors, as well as low levels of protein C, protein S, antithrombin, and other anticoagulant proteins. Usually, the reduction in pro-clotting factors and anti-clotting factors are in balance, and no coagulopathy results, even though you may see an elevated INR because of the reduced clotting factors. Third, liver insufficiency results in the liver being unable to remove toxins from the body. These toxins, such as ammonia, can build up in the bloodstream, crossing the blood-brain barrier, leading to encephalopathy, otherwise known as hepatic encephalopathy, a degeneration of neurological function involving confusion, asterixis, and other such neurological symptoms. Fourth, liver insufficiency results in reduced conjugation of bilirubin and reduced secretion of conjugated bilirubin into the bile duct, as well as reduced drainage of conjugated bilirubin out of the bile ducts. All of these factors result in an elevated bilirubin level within the body, and when the bilirubin level exceeds 40 to 50 micromoles per liter, that will result in jaundice and scleral icterus, yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. So that's it for the pathogenesis and complications of cirrhosis. For more on liver disease, you can check out my upcoming video explaining the stigmata or the signs and symptoms of chronic liver disease. If you learned something new from this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel so that others are better able to find these videos on YouTube. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.